thank you everyone for coming. This is a series of uh, webinars and they are based around, I suppose around, around mission, but with a, a focus on the older people in our community. We often find that when people talk about mission straight away, they think of children and young families or, or young people. So we're concentrating on, oh, yeah, yeah, but there is mission for other people in our society as well. And given that most churches are, are, are full of older people and we have plenty of older people in our in society, in our communities, why are we not ministering to them? So that's the focus, as have all our other webinars been the focus of. So we're going to talk today about community audits, and I'm sure all of you are thinking, I don't even know what that is. But it's one a really important part of um, thinking about mission, because how do you create a mission plan when you don't even know what your community is made up of? And it's no good sitting around a council, church council table and guessing. You actually have to either go out and talk to people. There are also ways in which you can do desk based research. And I use the term research quite loosely because straight away people are thinking oh blimey this is going to be a, a, a really sort of like um, dry thing to have to do just to know how to mission to our community but it, it, it isn't it's just one way of finding out where people are and what their needs might be so don't try not to fret too much about what that might mean um future webinars in this series will include how to do ideas, how to come up with ideas without falling out and how to talk to one another and listen to one another and then how to use those ideas to plan your mission. Your church may well already have a mission plan, but I can bet that it was probably created before the COVID years, which means it's out of date. And if you don't have one, then you probably do need one. Now we're moving into this weird and wonderful world post-COVID that's different from the one that we knew so well a couple of years ago. So lots of reasons why we, why we might want a mission plan. There is lots of support at district level, at regional level and at connectional level for those churches and circuits that want to think about mission. So please don't think you're on your own with this. We will also hopefully be holding a full day of a little bit more in-depth training about all the aspects of mission planning that you might need when you go ahead with this and I say when not if hey eh? hey it is a when isn't it so thank you for coming today this is your first opportunity to start exploring the idea of mission my name is Siggy I work for the learning network I'm based in Sheffield and we have with us today Kate Oliverio thanks Kate for coming who works for Youth Genesis She's done a lot of community auditing. She knows how you might do it. There's different ways of doing it. She's going to take us through some aspects of that. Her colleague, Tina, is unable to join us today. She's been called away. So Kate is going to have to do it all. So here we go. We will just take a short moment of giving our time to God. So I'll just open with a short prayer and then I will hand over to Kate. So let us pray. Loving Lord Jesus, take our minds and think through us. Take our hands and bless through us. Take our mouths and speak through us. Above all, Lord Jesus, take our spirit and pray in us so that it is you who moves and has your being in us as we go to serve our communities. Amen. So I'm going to hand over to Kate. Um, there will be a breakout. I'll explain the breakout now and I'll do it again when it comes to breakout time that you will be in small groups together, having a go at the first steps of what a community audit might look like. So you will base that on your own individual church, but you will be in groups so you can biff by ideas together or scratch heads together or go huh? together. So you will have the opportunity to talk to one another as you do your thing, but it will be based on your own church. So you get a flavor 
of what it's like. So I'll explain that again later, but in the meantime, I will pass over to Kate. Lovely, thank you, Osage. Um, so hello everybody, yes, um, um, I'm actually in Devon at the moment. Um, I um, have been working in community development for the last um, eight years where I've worked in with a number of communities across Devon, working to engage with them to to take advantage of all of the assets that they have in their communities and bring all of that together so they can make positive impacts. Um, so my the way I work is using an approach called asset based community development. And this is I don't know if people are aware of it, but it's based on the belief that everything the community needs to achieve what it needs to achieve is, is already there. And, and the skill is about teasing that out, about valuing the knowledge that's held within, from, within people, different people and different communities of interest within their, that community, finding that information out and then, and then moving forward together. Um, so there's obviously, there's two different ways that you can go about trying to find information um, about your community. There's the desk-based research where you can look at statistics and we're gonna come on to that later. Um, but where I tend to spend a lot of my time is going out and actually speaking to people and using um, a more sort of um, digging down, trying to get that richer picture of, of what the community looks like and why people do things in the community. So I'm just gonna start a, a presentation now where I'm just gonna go through um, through that with you. And hopefully at the end of it, we'll, um, or sort of know a little bit more about that creative side and what, what you can do to, to engage with people. Okay, so um, some of the things I want to look at today, just really quickly, is what you need in terms of a toolkit to go out, what, what are your basic tools that you can use to go out and um, speak with people, look at some examples of those community, um, that, that creative side of community um, engagement, and then also the mapping exercise, but Quickly, just before we go into that, um, I just want to have just break down really quickly what it is to actually go out and engage with the community and what does it mean? Because the first, this really is the first starting point of you, you going out and really wanting to, to speak to people is you need to have a think about who is that community? Because we all have our own experience, but the community is probably a lot bigger than our own personal experience. So, if you are wanting to go out and, and speak to people about creating mission around older people, who are your stakeholders? Because it won't just be older people that are out in your community. It will be their families. It will be carers. It will be organisations that work with um, older people. And it will be younger people as well. So it's about keeping our mind open to what is that community and who are the groups of people that we need to speak to when we do go out. And then the engagement side is we need to know what we're asking people when we do go out and engage with them. What do we need to achieve information wise? What do we need to tease from them? Do we need to know what their experience of being older in our community is? Do we want to know where they go within their community to to you know what groups they go to where do they go to for information and advice um you know where do they go to for fun um and support so we really really want to be able to know what the questions are that we're asking so when we do eventually go out into the community to ask people questions I just wanted to put this quickly into the presentation because sometimes one of our barriers for not wanting to go out and ask people questions, we think they're going to be really negative about what we want to talk to them about. And um, you're going to get a copy of this presentation, but um, right here is just a link to a TED talk and it's really, really useful about what some of those barriers are to people engaging with new ideas. Um, I'm just going to quickly go through them though. So the first one is when you go out into a community and you say, we're thinking of doing this, what do you think is learned helplessness? Communities will say things like, we tried that already. They never spend money here. You're told off of doing that. Things are used to be better around here. And, and often that can really be quite deflating when you're trying to get the community excited about an idea. 
The way to combat that is to find the people in your community who are the connectors, who are going to be the people that they'll say, let's give it a go anyway. Let, who, who are those people that will get excited about your idea, who will anchor that idea and get, get people in the community around it? Then you've got the Loki of control. So a lot of people will see a problem and they'll think that it's outside of their ex experience to be able to assist with. So first of all, if you've got an idea, so let's say you wanted to set up a holiday club for older people, who do you need permission from to do that? A lot of the time we think we need permission to do things, to go and speak to people, to put on an event. And a lot of the time we actually don't, we just need to crack on and do it. But also it's about giving permission to other people to help us as well. So it's about if, you know, if you're looking for volunteers to help you make your, your um, activity work, then it's about us as the initiators saying to people, you can help, we will value your contribution. And that empowers people and that's a really positive thing. Then there's functional fixedness, and I'm sure everybody's come across this. You can't use the church for that because it's the church. That's a perfect example. You can't have a coffee morning in the foyer of the church. Well, actually, actually you can. And I love this um, image because it says 21 cool ways to use paperclip. And I think it really, really demonstrates the fact that, you know, a wall doesn't just need to be a wall. It can be an art canvas. It can be an engagement tool. So, what are we doing to look at the assets that, that are in our community, making sure that we're utilising them as much as possible to help us achieve what we're setting out to achieve? And then the final thing that we will come up against when we go out into the community and start engaging with people is the bystander effect. And how do we get people to think about their own skills and how they can con contribute? A lot of people are always looking, I'm not going to pick that litter up because someone else will do it. So how do we get people to start taking responsibility for their own community and how do we get them to, to get on board with what we're doing? So, so these are, those are the, the four things that you might come up against, but there's also the way that you can challenge that. Um, and once you do challenge it, people will start to open up and they'll start to get really excited about what it is that you're doing. So. So you, you know who your stakeholders are, you know where they are, you know what you're going to ask them and you know how to overcome any of the barriers that they're going to throw up when you go out and try and speak to them. So next I want to talk about what the examples of the different ways that you can go out and creatively engage with people. And there are lots and lots of different ways and I have in the past worked on a project called Aging Well. Um, there's 15 locations across, um, across England um, and the aim of these projects that were lottery funded is that they were trying to reduce isolation and improve the experience of older people in our communities. Um, and in order to engage with older people, find out what they wanted, try and encourage them to create their own solutions in their communities for some of the issues that they were facing, we use creative engagement techniques. Um, and the reason you might want to use a creative engagement technique as a part, uh, you know, as opposed to just going out with a questionnaire, um, is that you get a richer amount of information if you're being interesting, firstly. Um, but secondly, as well, if you're doing something interesting, someone is more likely to come over to you and ask you what you're doing. And in that instance, you're creating a better power dynamic between you and the person that's asking that question. They're immediately interested in what you're doing. And they're going to be more willing to engage with, with what, you're, what you are doing and, and to give you the information that you're trying to to get. So the first thing that you can do is put on a community meal. Um, I've created community, you know, put on community meals um, on a number of different occasions and they are really, really useful to do because you can, you can do it in a number of different ways where you can provide the food or you can ask people to bring the food with them, especially if you're in a multicultural 
environment you're going to be getting a lot of different things coming in people are going to be really really interested and a free meal people will come to um whilst people are there you can ask questions you can put on activities where you're able to draw out the information that you need from people and it's also a place where you can mix people together that might not normally come together and that always brings about a really rich conversation um, that you, you can mine for the information that you need. Next idea is around community shops and engagement spaces. So um, it doesn't have to be a shop, but unfortunately there are a lot of empty spaces on our high streets at the moment. Um, and there are some really, really great examples of community groups taking over these shops and turning them into an engagement space where people can come in and they can be asked a couple of questions and people will just come in because they're interested to know what is going on in that shop but it's also within their own time they were on the high street anyway you can get a really good mix of people coming together because the high street does attract quite a varied group of people and when you're in there you can have as you can see there can be chalkboards on the wall where people can write in chalk you can have sticky like post-it notes you can have mapping exercises you can do all sorts of things or you can sit people down with a cup of tea and coffee and just talk to them as well so these are really really useful engagement spaces where you can you can really um speak to a lot of people over a long period of time and get quite a lot of information from them then there's asset mapping so this technique is where you can you basically take a massive piece of paper and it will be plain and on it you will say to people you'll choose a particular neighborhood or a particular area and you'll say to people right i want you to draw all of the physical assets the people assets and your organizational assets onto this piece of paper now if i was to do that I would only be able to come up with what my experience and my community is, but by inviting everybody in to contribute to that mapping exercise, you get a really rich picture of where are the buildings, the equipment, the vehicles, the parks that people use. Who are the people, who are the neighbours within our community who know, who's that person that knows everybody else? Who's that person that has a minibus driving license that no one else knew about? Who are the groups that are operating in that area? And who's the council and the community partnerships? And it all gets mapped down. And what this tells us, as much as it tells us what's on there, it also tells us what isn't. So if you've got a community centre that does not appear on that map, you know there's a reason for that. And you can then find out why aren't people using that community centre? What's the barriers to people accessing that community asset? Or if you were looking to put on an event, perhaps maybe you choose a location on the map that looks the most popular with the community. So it's a really, really useful exercise. And it's something that you don't just do once, you continue to do. And it can actually show your journey from when you first start to do your community engagement towards the end of your community engagement, it can show the journey that, that the community has gone on in terms of the way that it engages with its physical assets and the groups. Hopefully you'll see more groups um, build over time and hopefully you'll see more people assets develop as people start to unearth all of those skills and lovely stuff going on in the community. Now, one of the things that I did when I was working um, on the Aiden Wild project is we took an entire living room out into the street. And that might sound bizarre, but it's what we did. We had a sofa, we had a rug on the floor, we had a gazebo that we all put it under as well. There was a lamp that obviously wasn't switched on. And it was a really visually effective thing to do because people were coming over to us and saying, why have you got a living room in the middle of your street? Why is there a sofa there? And what you do is you invite people in and it's about creating that space. So, so often our conversations that we have are in our living room where we've got somewhere comfortable to sit, 
where there's a biscuit, where there's a cup of tea for somebody, and you open up when you're in that environment. It's about recreating that in, in the street and getting people to engage with you. And so many people did. One, because it was the bizarrest thing that they've ever done. But secondly, because they, as I said, they were comfortable to speak to us because they had somewhere to sit. And especially with slight, the slightly older demographic, um, you know, they were happy to sit down and have a cup of tea with us and, and to uh, and just take a moment to talk about what their experience was and to feel valued in that way. And, and the, the street is a really amazing place to go and do engagement um, because one, it's hyper local and two, you've got people who are out and about you haven't got just one group there there's a lovely mix of people that come through now these are a couple of other ways that you can engage with people so the the one at the top of the trees that have got lots of paper on it we call these ideas trees or wishing trees and i'm sure you, you've possibly come across this before as well um, where people will have a leaf or they'll have a piece of paper and they can write down what, you know, an answer to a question or an idea that they might have for their community or, you know, what they think, you know, is missing. And they're then able to place that onto the tree. And it's so simple. I've used this in schools and, and with it being Christmas time, it's actually a really great time of the year um, to, to implement this idea. And I've done it in a school where we got primary school children and we'd cut out card baubles and we got them to say what their wish for their community was. And what it showed us such a brilliant like, eye view of what the issues were. So people came back and said that they were particularly worried about fast traffic. They were worried about litter, but that the young people were also picking up on the financial strains that their family were experiencing. It really helped us. To, to target our work after that point and after having that information. And again, because it's visually appealing, people will come over and want to get involved in it. Um, the little man that you can see at the bottom of, of the slide, um, this is something that I do with people all the time where I get them to sit down and sort of think about think about themselves and on on the little man there'll be a question so what are your skills where do you like to go and you get people to fill that out and they think it's you know it's, it's cute it takes two minutes it's not a massively um time consuming thing to do and then at the end of it you have this entire like population of people and you know what their names are you know what their contact details are and you know what their skills are and it's a really useful way to create a skills bank and to get people to um to, to open up about what it is that they can offer into their community on the right hand side you can see the post-it note these are, this is the Rosebud Thorn um, activity that is really, really great to do with people. And it's really simple. All you need are, um, are, are post-it notes and pens. And what you do is you get people to think about what's good in their community. And that's the rose. And they write that on your post-it note. And then the bud is what, what are the opportunities that could happen in this community? And then the thorn is what's wrong, what could be better? And by getting lots of people in groups to do this, and you, you can just do it on a wall where people can just come in, you know, maybe it'll be in your community shop or maybe it'll be at your, your community meal and you can cover a wall in all of those rose buds and fawns. And then you're able to group that together to find out what the trends are, you know, what, what are the really brilliant things that people appreciate in their community? What are the things that need improving? And then obviously you can respond to that with what your next steps are in terms of addressing those issues for people. Another really good one is the paper. You can provide people with a blank newspaper template and you can say to them, in five years time, what do you want the headlines to be about your community? What are your, what are your hopes? And people might come back and they might say, you know, um, 
wherever they live, the grand opening of a new community centre, for example. And from that, you're able to, to really get hold of people's aspirations. And it's a little bit silly and it's a little bit grandiose, but I mean, people really, really do do sort of like tell you what they want and what they want to see for their for their community in the future. Um, obviously, you can also get find out what people find that they don't enjoy about their community from this activity because it might say something like um, crime at zero, for example. And it's it's just a really good way about digging down and finding out exactly what people what people think and and what what they want to to achieve moving forwards. Um, obviously, my take home from this is the fact that if you're out in the community and you're going to be carrying out any of these um, creative engagement techniques, the most important thing to do is to make sure that people feel comfortable coming over to you by having, um, by, by using these tools and these techniques. As I've mentioned before, people will approach you and that's a slightly different dynamics when you're trying to stop people in the street when they're busy, they, they're more likely to say no to you, they don't want to speak to you. Whereas with this approach, people will come over to you, they'll spend a little bit longer speaking to you, they wanna find out what it is that you're doing. And, and, and a result of that is that you get a much richer um, amount of information from them. So what needs to be in the basic toolkit then for this community um, creative engagement technique? So first of all, I say you always need to have a notebook with you if you're going out to deliver any, any um, engagement because you need to make a note of the conversations that you have, not, not maybe whilst you're directly speaking with someone, but maybe you've had a really um, interesting conversation with someone, they've told you a bit of information, you wanna be able to go away and quickly write that information down. So I would say definitely always have a notebook with you. Post-it notes again, the Rosebud Fawn um, activity is one that, you know, you never know when the opportunity to engage with people are and just carrying those with you. It's a really quick activity that you can just get people to do if the opportunity presents itself. You want to make sure you've got some plain paper so that you can do your asset mapping so that you can say to people quickly write down what your physical assets are. Let's let's focus on this particular street, for example, let's draw it. Where, where's all the assets in, in this? Where, where are the people? Where are the connectors? Where are the buildings that matter to people? And, th and that can be done really quickly. And, and especially if you've got pens with you. So always carry pens, always carry paper and a notebook. And obviously, if you can, get a wishing tree because, um, again, it's just a really quick exercise that always, always works in attracting people to, um, to speak with you. So. What I, what I was hoping that we could do through the breakout session is focus on the asset mapping exercise that I talked about. So obviously you're all from an individual church. So a good starting point when asset mapping is to think about what you know. It's always good to have the asset map a little bit populated first because it encourages other people to write things down. So you actually starting from the point in, and an asset map can look any look like anything. So it it's a little bit crafty. It, you know, it's not going to look like a perfect piece of art and you don't want to put that much pressure on yourself. So even if you just draw drew a line and said that it was a particular street, that's absolutely fine. If you wanna just draw a square for, to, to denote what a particular building looked like, that's absolutely fine as well. Or you can just make a little, like a list of what you think the physical assets are, the people assets and the organizational assets are for your community. So what I wanted to do was to, to send everybody out and just have them spend a little bit of time Focusing maybe on um, for them to pick a location within their community. Um, so it could be the area around where your church is, it could be the area around where your home is, or maybe you've got a hobby or something. Just pick a location and for you to just think about that community and, and what its assets are. 
Okay, everybody. So um, I hope you found that useful. Um, so what you should have now in front of you is either an image or a list of all of those assets from, that are within your, your community and within, within the proximity to um, the, the location that you chose. How easy did people find it to do? If you found it easy, do you want to just pop your hand up? And just let me let me know. No, so people did. Does anyone want to explain why they found it difficult at all? The main thing we said was, you know, we can come up with certain ideas ourselves, but it's only from our own perspective. There, there's so many other people that will have different ideas about what is essential to the community. So, like you said, it will make it a broader conversation to bring in all this expertise absolutely and i mean what you your next step would then be to take that 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 image that you've created that all that information and take that out into the community community settings where you know people are so it could be the school gates we i call them bumping spaces it could be a bus stop that people use quite a lot and you know it's quite friendly you can even take it on a bus um we've got a bus service down here um that you know, we know that certain people will, will go on to just because they know that at an exact time of day, the same people will be on there and it's their little day trip out. It's a really good group to engage with, actually, and you get to go down to Stoke Gabriel and back. So, um, so it is really useful. And what often happens when you have a look at this map once you've done it is there'll, there'll be really obvious gaps. And it might be that you're not able to reach a particular um group within the community maybe it's a hidden community that um that, that your church might not have have members of um and so it's also about them thinking how can you how can you reach out to those groups and get them to contribute to it as well um so yeah thank you so much for taking the time to do that i do hope that um it, it kind of got people thinking about you know as you say what is important in the community and what might be important to other people so that's that's really brilliant thank you um what we're going to be doing now is we're going to be looking at um a bit more of a traditional way of going about doing a community audit um and this is what we might traditionally call the statistics the death space research um, so what I'm going to do first of all is I'm going to show you a community audit that my colleague Tina put together. Um, it's based on a locality within um, within Devon here. It's called a King's Ash. It's a ward within Torbay. Um, so I'm just going to run that through with you really, really quickly. And then I'm going to show you how she got the information to populate this community audit. So I'm hoping that um, everybody can uh, see this. So, um, as I said, it's a, for a profile called King's Ash. Um, as you can see on here, um, what Tina was able to find out was she was able to find out what the total population was of, of Paynton, which was 51,000. And she knows that the average age of the population is 49. Um, she was able to find out about what the population distribution was in terms of age groups. And she's able to see that the expectation is that that population is going to age over the next however many years. And she's even able to find an infographic here that, that, that details that pictorially for her. Um, and this is, you know, this is another graph that she's able to have a look at. So she's able to sort of like show what the national picture is and then show it against what the local um, picture is in Torbay and just to show. Um, so this is another um, image and it shows that the percentage of children in low income families from 2012 to 2016 in Payton was 19.7% and in England we know it's 18%. So what we're able to take from that is that you know, there are more children living in a low income household in Paynton than the rest of, of the country's average. And this has come from public health, has come from the JSNA, the Joint Strategic Needs Assessment, and I'll be showing you 
um, exactly what that is and the breadth of information that that document can hold in, a, in just a little bit. So, you know, you can find out a lot of information um, from, from this desk-based research. And um, if, you know, you can choose your particular age group. This one is obviously based um, around younger people. Um, you know, she's been able to find out about the amount of money that schools pay to um, to support young people, how young people are attaining in their in their um, education, and also things like conception rates and health data. Now, your desk based research is most likely to only show you demographic data and at a certain level. Um, so it will give you information about maybe a particular ward, a particular area, a city or a national picture. Um, and what I want you guys to take from today is the fact that by com combining this statistical data with that creative engagement that you do where you go and actually physically speak to people, you can create a really rich picture. And it's not about choosing one or the other. The best situation is when you choose both and that you're able to bring it together and create a really full picture of what's going on in your community. So you're also able to find out from your partner organisations that are operating in your area. And Citizens Advice are really, really great at sharing information about what the issues are and how many people are coming to see them. Um, so this is, this is one of their breakdowns where they're able to show that, um, you know, debt, benefits and housing, they're all issues that in, in our area in Tor Bay are significantly higher than elsewhere. Um, and that's really, really important to know if you're wanting to think about how you can support people and what maybe you're going to focus your time and efforts on. So the, the traditional audit also does do mapping. But what it's less likely to do is involve a wider group of people in, in trying to figure out what those are. And it will just create a list like this. What you get from going and doing the creative engagement side of things is get to speak to people as they're doing it and find out, get the stories around these assets and really just sort of like pad that out in terms of information. Um, so these are just a few, a few more that people were able to add that were like the community-based. Um, oh gosh. So I just keep just skip through here. Um, so that was Tor Bay as a whole, and then this is the King's Ash Ward. So you can show, you know, you can have a look at your map, you can see physically what it looks like, you can see where there's um high housing density. Um you can see where there's gaps, where there's green spaces, what people's proximity to shopping locations are, like how isolated is that community? Um, where are the services in relation to that? You can get all of this still from desk-based research. And it's, it's a really useful thing to do. It's just a bit, bit of information here about um, academically what people would consider to be a community profile. Um, so it's you know it is achieving the same thing doing the desk based research as the creative engagement side but as i say combining the two does give you that richer picture and again you've gone to the your joint strategic needs assessment to find out about what your profile is demographically what are the ages of your population how many people are working how many people are have got long-term health conditions um how many people are claiming certain benefits how many people are aged over a certain amount and claiming um a pension credit for example this is all really, really useful things to be able to understand what the deprivation rates within a local area are, where, where there's sort of more affluence and, and, and the coinciding impact of that. Okay, so just, just quickly showing these, just so you can have a look and you can see what it looks like. Okay, so this is, this is that more strategic um desk based traditional community audits I've explained. Okay. 
So there were a number of places that Tina went to to get all of that lovely information. And one that I mentioned quite often was the Joint Strategic Needs Assessment. This is a document that local authorities produce. It's normally through public health and it happens on an, on an either an annual basis or a biannual basis. And it's where they gather together the demographic, the health data, and they bring it together in a really lovely document. And it, it just gives an overall picture of what's going on in the communities. So what I have done is created this link here, which hopefully will work if I do this. And it should take us to, I, I chose Collie neighbourhood area of Sheffield, um, I just picked one. Um, and this is the information that it gives us about that particular area. So it tells us, this is an overview. So it tells us what the population is, it tells us about the education and skills, vulnerable groups, housing, health and wellbeing. And some of these statistics are really, really interesting. Um, for example, the fact that 4% of households lack, lack central heating in Collie neighbourhood compared with 3% across England. So what does that mean? That could mean that you've got a group of people within your community that are experiencing fuel poverty. And that might be something that you, in terms of your mission, might, might want to focus on. But this is a really, really interesting document. As I say, the, the link is in the PowerPoint presentation. So I do want you guys to go away and maybe just have a little look at, at this. But one thing that I do want to do is just really, really quickly just take you down to a particular area. If you just bear me one second. <clears throat> it's this one here. So this is looking at particularly older pet people within the Collie neighbourhood of Sheffield. So from it, we can say that there's 318 pensioner households that don't have a car. That means they're reliant upon public transport. And that's an indicator of potentially um, experiencing isolation, especially if your other death rate research is telling you that transport links are, are reducing an area, they're cancelling bus services. So in Torbay, we've got quite a hilly um, geography and there's a lot of people that, that brought a house on top of a hill when they were able to drive. And as they've got older, they've had to give up their car, but that's okay because there's a bus service that runs outside their door. But as pressures, you know, financial pressures have happened, the bus services have been cancelled and there's no longer a bus that runs outside their front door and therefore they're finding it really difficult to get out and experiencing loneliness. So that's a really important statistic to be able to know about like the local community. Then you've got the pension credit claimant. So you've got 167 people there as well. And households of one pensioner, so there's 247 households within that area. Now, what this doesn't tell you is where those 247 potentially isolated people are, but you know they're there so you can go out into your community you can ask does anyone know if their neighbor is lonely you know when uh, does anyone have a neighbor that lives on their own where are these people and how do we go about making sure that they feel a part of their community so it's a really really good starting point in terms of trying to find out what is going on in your community and what you can do um, to support people moving forwards. And I mean, this document, I can't praise this document enough. It's got so much information in it. And it's, it's what forms the strategy of the council, of the local authority, the NHS trust. And by you using it, you create this thread so that you are then part of that wider effort to create change within those communities. You know, you're not working against what's happening. And it will also mean that you are more likely to get funding if you can demonstrate that you're using documents like this to inform um, what you're doing. Okay. So that's the Joint Strategic Needs Assessment. Then we've got the Office of National Statistics. Again, collects everything about it, doesn't it? You can go into their website and you can start, you can put in where you live 
and it will throw up all of this lovely information. Um, it'll tell you, you know, unfortunately, how many homeless people. Now, this statistic around homelessness will, I can guarantee, be much lower than the actual statistic. And so what is being reported by the local authority versus what local organisations and local knowledge has, it shows why it's so important to question these statistics and to go out and speak to your partner organisations that are working with different people and say, is this true? Is this a true reflection of what's going on? So I love statistics, but always question them, always try and find out how they've been formulated and always make sure that you take into account the wider knowledge of your community and not just take them as read. Again, you can see that there's information there about lone parents, you know the economic um, prosperity of your local area, employment, lots and lots of information. It's a really lovely, lovely and well laid out website in terms of trying to find information. Okay, then you've got the indices of deprivation. Um, this is something that is created that shows those areas in England and the United Kingdom and rates them against one another in terms of the level of deprivation. Um, some funders will only fund areas that are in the top 20% most deprived. So being able to have a look at, at, at this indice to find out about it. It's on the .gov website. It's another really well laid out um, document, um, website, sorry. You can go onto the documents that are there. This one's 2019, and you can find out for particularly, like particularly your area, um, where it ranks on that list. Okay. And then crime statistics for your area. How safe do people feel? So, um, I don't know whether um, it's likely that there'll be neighbourhood watch groups that are operating in your area. Um, and maybe that's something that you haven't got on your asset map, but maybe you might be quickly scribbling down right now. Um, those groups are really, really important because they will know um, about these crime statistics. They'll know how it's affecting local people, whether there's particular worry at that moment because um, there's been a spate of robberies, for example. Um, and, and that information might help you to decide, well, how are we going to help make, make people feel more secure in their community? Now, this website is really, really good because, again, you can put in the particular area where you um, want to find out about. So we'll just put in Sheffield. Apologies if no one is from Sheffield. but So it immediately comes up with this. Okay, so it you know it's not it's not the most positive <laughs> picture um, to have a look at, but I think it's important to be able to know what is going on. And there's also this crime map that comes up, and it just shows you where some of the hotspots are for particular um, crimes. Um, now, if you know that you've got a high older population in an area that is experiencing high crime. Then that might be that might be somewhere that you might want to focus your efforts on because how how do how do older people feel in that community? How how can we support them to feel more secure? So all of this information is all it's just really really useful in terms of painting a picture of what is going on in the community. As I say, all of these links, all of these links are in the presentation so all you need to do is do as i've done is click on those and it will take you straight through so we'll go straight into um a q a so we've got around about 10 minutes for you to ask kate any questions either to do with the creative stuff that she talked about before the other breakout or this bit about the stats etc so any any questions that that you would like to ask her um, fire away you, if you can either because we can all fit on one screen either use the raise hands or you can put your own physical hand up I should be able to see you all 
Sorry, I forgot. Uh, All right. Yeah, one of the things we talked about in our breakout group was about how it always seems easy to engage certain parts of the community than others. And I, I'm warm to a lot of the creative suggestions, but I could see that if we did it in our community, that there would be a lot of people who just walked straight past and the ones that, and they would be the ones that you would want to engage with more because you don't engage with them naturally. And the ones who came and sat and talked or whatever would be the ones who would want to do that anyway. Okay, so um, I, I've got this theory that I call certain people second waivers because there's people who you're going to find difficult to engage, as you say, but once you start getting a bit of energy around the idea and what you're doing, it then sort of attracts people. It's like moths to a, a flame. So um, I think the first thing is not to put too much pressure if you are doing a, an engagement event and you're finding you're not capturing anybody, everybody. The second thing is to go, if that if you're noticing that it's a particular group of people, um, it's about just digging down and trying to find who's the person who can introduce you to that group. Um, it might be about, you know, maybe um, you've got a friend who is, a, it may, maybe let's say it's young mums who've got babies in a push day, doing street-based engagement, they just want to get home. Um, you know, where, where are they going? So they're probably going to nursery, they're probably going to groups. So it's about going where they go in, but then also it might be about um, getting a young mum on board to be part of that group of people who are engaging. So people can identify themselves within your group as, as well. That's, that Those would be my top tips there. But, you know, you're not going to be able to get absolutely everybody. I mean, it would be the dream. Um, but, but those would be my tips for, for trying to reach out to people. Yeah, I was going to say, well, one of the, the kind of where we got into it in our discussion was, I suppose, kind of talking about the, almost the, the level of thought that we need to put into how we engage with our own people and, and the people within our churches about kind of almost as a precursor to doing some of the kind of community audit and, and just the, the level of thought that we need to put into making sure people understand kind of what we're trying to do, what 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 we what we're hoping we might achieve. Um and and, and that it's not too difficult or, or intimidating a thing for them. Um which is all sorts of questions in there about um kind of are we trying to discover things that we can do? Are we trying to discover things that, that someone else would then be able to bring to fulfillment within the community um, uh, and that just kind of scale of engagement and just making sure people don't think that they're signing up to something for the next 27 years if they agree to help us do some survey work so all of that internal conversation first to make sure that we're ready to to do something like this kind of well with with people's engagement i think sometimes what's a really good um a a good tool to start a conversation with the community is about what what you can offer and having that conversation within um your group around what is it that you've got so if you've got a, a, a rooms maybe you're able to hire them out to groups you know because when you get into the community you, you need to be aware about what it is that you're offering as well um, and often that opens up conversations in itself um, and you might find that um that the, what the community needs, they just need space and you have space and just being open to answering that call from the community um, and just maybe framing it that way, it kind of takes the pressure off. You're not offering anything that you don't already have. You're not going to be signed up to doing something that is going to be a lot of hard work because it's already there. It's kind of like, like knowing yourself and what you can off offer out. Um, is often a really good um, conversation starter within groups in terms of um, how they're then going to move that out into the community. And thank you so much for presenting today. It's been really engaging. I've it's a it's a long while since I've done desktop research, and I, I wonder how much has changed. And uh, actually, it's, it's a lot better than it used to be, and a lot more accessible. So that's really nice to see. 
so thank you so much for for today um the next webinar is on the 16th of february and this is around generating mission ideas that are relevant to your situation and how to do it without falling out how to do it while allowing everybody to have their say and feel safe to do so so we'll only be touching upon this of course but it will give you an idea of how it might work we will be um, having a workshop next next year later on next year that will show you these all of these techniques in a little bit of a greater detail that will give you opportunity to explore more deeply we can only give you a snapshot during these webinars so we do hope that you'll join us on the 16th of february to just have a quick squiz about how you might generate mission ideas that are relevant and that will work one hopes uh, and how not to fall out um, so that's where we are now. Um, so thank you so much for coming today. It's been lovely to see you all, and I hope it's been useful for you. Um, and we're going to close now um, with a prayer before we wave you all off to the rest of your day. So let us pray together. Jesus, where are you taking me? into joy, into pain. I am afraid, but to do anything other than go with you and where you want me to go would be to die inwardly and to look for wholeness apart from you and to look for things that you haven't asked me to do would be to lose my true self and my relationship with you. So I come to you, protesting and confused, but loving you all the same. You'll have to hold on to me as we walk together through this compelling and frightening landscape of the kingdom and the mission of God. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Go in peace, and we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. Thank you.